Charlie Staples has been an area designer and area design lead at Obsidian for over a decade. And in that time, he's worked on titles such as Alpha Protocol, Fault New Vegas, and most recently, The Outer Worlds. To begin, I asked Charlie when he joined Obsidian and about his responsibilities during FNV's development. I joined Obsidian in April of 2007. On FNV, I started out doing area design work and then shifted into the role of area design lead. I worked on Camp Forlorn Hope, The Strip, LVB Station, NCR Embassy, as well as the overall strip exterior, and Hoover Dam for Arizona Killer and You'll Know When It Happens, as well as the in-game battles. Near the end of the project, I was responsible for a lot of the optimization of getting the game to run on consoles. I also was the area design lead on all of the main DLCs, giving overall high-level direction and goals for the area design and features, as well as reviewing quests and areas and providing feedback. Following up, I ask if he had any favorite parts of the game that he designed. One thing that comes to mind is at the end of the game where you can have Yes Man throw General Oliver off of Hoover Dam. We were putting together the end of the game, and I was reading through the conversation between General Oliver and the player, and someone, don't remember who, wrote that line where the player can tell Yes Man to throw him off the bridge. I saw that, and thought it sucks to tell Yes Man to do that, and not actually see it happen. So, I spent about an hour and set up the quick scene, and it ended up working pretty well. And you can watch it loop on YouTube for 15 minutes. Next, I ask about the design process for Camp Forlorn Hope. The overall design for Camp Forlorn Hope didn't deviate much from the original plan. We really wanted to focus on making sure that we communicated the dire strait that the NCR forces there were in, and also that it reflected the name Forlorn Hope. The blockout that I made is pretty similar to what is in-game, with the artist and world builders cleaning up my initial work on it. The goal from the beginning was to have it feel like a ramshackle base that didn't even resemble a military base, and to make sure that our visual storytelling was reinforcing the behaviors and dialogues of the NPCs in the area, to get the area feeling cohesive, and overall grim and dire. Arizona Killer is my favorite Legion quest in the game, simply due to all of the methods you have available for assassinating President Kimball. From planning C4 in a helmet, to reprogramming an anti-aircraft gun, or even just a well-aimed throwing spear. So I asked Charlie about his process for designing the quest. I'm actually not happy with the scripting implementation of it. It's a pretty big mess. I remember looking at it right before the game shipped, and thought to myself, if I could do it all over again, I'm sure I could do this a better way. However, I'm glad it all worked out. It was a pretty daunting task to start out with, so I just started getting the basic skeleton of the quest working first. Get the vertebrae to fly in, land, wait, and then leave. Then I started to add in additional elements to keep fleshing it out and giving the player more options. The big focus for me was to make sure that I didn't have to do a lot of unique things, and that if an event happened, I could go back to the basic skeleton and have it work with everything else I had set up. Specifically, I tried to do one setup for Shit Hit The Fan, and anytime something bad happened, that setup fired. 
Reusing elements helped me reduce the complexity and not have a lot of unique scripting for each thing that could happen. The quest functions as intended, but we had to scope down the number of NPCs listening to the speech for performance reasons. Originally, I think I had over 50 NPCs in the crowd, in addition to all of the other Critical Quest NPCs. We ended up trimming back the number of NPCs all around, but it didn't change anything about how the quest functioned. Next, I ask about crunch and cut content on the project. Crunch was rough on FNV, but I don't recall crunching that much on the DLCs. We had a shorter development cycle for them, and we pushed harder to keep those within a feasible scope that we could complete in the time we had. I'm mostly sad that we had to change a lot of things to get them running on console. The big thing for me is that I would have liked to have had the strip work without the gates breaking it up into different sections. For the Old World Blues DLC, we were trying to get in a weapon that acted like a grenade launcher, but instead of grenades, it launched a special grenade that spawned robo-scorpions to fight your enemies. We got this functional, but there were enough bugs with it and intermittent problems with the AI that we didn't have time to fix, so we cut those. I wish we could have gotten that working because I think that would have been really fun for players and would have fit well within that DLC. The DLCs have very little unused content, particularly when compared to the core game, so I asked Charlie about it. Since the DLCs had a lot less production time, we were a lot more focused on the DLCs and making sure the content we were creating was worthwhile and going to be used. We also made an effort to clean up any unused content so the patch slash update sizes would be smaller. I've spoken about the core game's development issues at length in previous videos, and as area design lead, I was curious about Charlie's thoughts on the subject. It was pretty frustrating to have a certain vision for the project, and then hit some walls on executing that vision due to either engine issues or hardware limitations for consoles. During much of production, there wasn't a lot of concern for performance or budgets. We were just focused on building the game that we wanted to make. Once we started running the game on consoles and seeing the performance issues we had there, it was a big red flag and we had to do a lot of extreme things to get the game working. We managed to get the game running on consoles. Some areas only needed minor revisions and improvements, but other locations needed more severe changes, which sometimes lost a bit of what we intended to have going on in those areas. We did better on the DLCs as we were aware of those constraints and worked on building within those from the beginning. But we also scoped and scaled back our goals due to our experiences on the main game. Nearing the end of our interview, I ask if working on FNV changed his approach to game design. Working on FNV reinforced some basic design principles, such as KISS, keep it simple stupid. Making crazy complicated and detailed quests or scripting doesn't hold up as well in a game where players have a lot of freedom and choice. Additionally, a lot of the best received parts of FNV were simple quests and setups that had a cool premise, an interesting idea, and allowed player freedom, and not a lot on the crazy, heavily scripted setups. The terrain in the DLCs utilize verticality in a way that isn't seen in the core game, and I asked Charlie about it. This was a combination of our area designers and world builders being more experienced, and us also wanting to push our environments more to be a bit more visually impressive 
and fun for players to move around. We focused on smaller environments that had a bit more detail put into each part of them than compared to the base game. Finally, I ask what it's like to have worked on FNV. It's awesome to see people still playing the game and still modding the game. We put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it, so it's nice to see players really appreciate it. And that's all for my interview with Obsidian designer Charlie Staples. As always, thanks for watching.